Ontario is planning to have a new sex education curriculum in place by the 2015-16 school year. The rollout didn't go so well for Dalton McGuinty's Liberals back in 2010. Joining us now to detail why Take Two will be different, here's Liz Sandals, Ontario's Education Minister and the MPP for Guelph. Welcome back to TVO. It's nice to see you again. Hello there. It's great to be here. So let's figure out why this is the right time to try this again. How come? I think because we need to do it. When you look at the data uh, about public health data, when you look at how the world has changed since 1998, which is the data on the current curriculum in terms of internet safety and sexting and a whole bunch of topics that we actually need to teach kids about, I just think this is the right time to do it for the kids because the kids need the information. So that's the biggest difference is that now we're into a whole different online world which didn't exist when the law was previously drafted. Is that the idea? Well, the curriculum that we have right now dates from 1998, which means the prep work was done 96, 97. And the world's changed a lot. No kidding. I mean, we're almost 20 years out here. It needs an update. And when we look at um, provinces that we would compare ourselves to, and we always do that as part of the curriculum process, as we sort of benchmark ourselves against other Canadian provinces. We're way behind where BC and Alberta and Saskatchewan, a lot of the provinces that typically we're in sync with so, uh, in terms of the information that the, the kids received. Well, one of the reasons that it didn't fly four years ago when then Premier McGuinty tried to bring it forward was that there was a lot of opposition. And when some people heard that you were going to be on our program today, they sent us a statement. This one's from a group called Citizens for Good Education. And part of their concern is in this quote. It says, some of the planned classroom instruction generally made parents feel uncomfortable, such as those which would actively encourage 12-year-olds to masturbate as one way of learning about your body and teach 8-year-olds that being male or female is merely a social construct. Uh, what do you think of these observations? Well, number one, I'm not sure how they have decided that that's what's going to be in the proposed curriculum, given that we haven't finalized it, so perhaps they know more than I do. But the other thing that I would comment is that uh, when we do curriculum, and it doesn't matter whether it's phys ed or whether it's math or science, whatever it is, it, it starts out with here's a learning expectation. And remember, this is communication to adults. So here's the expectation about what kids are supposed to learn. If they happen to ask you this question, here would be a suitable response. So, so often... It's bottom up as opposed to top down Yeah, in that so because we actually want to help teachers be prepared for things that kids might ask. That's, that's part of preparing teachers to teach. Let me just be teach. clear. So the, the, the ideas that were advanced in, these, in this excerpt I just read, it's not the plan for the teacher to introduce these ideas to the students. Are you telling us it's in fact if the students raise these ideas, this is how the teacher can respond? Exactly. I've got that right. Exactly. Okay. Next follow-up. Um, how do, again, last time out four years ago, there was, a, I guess, a lot of complaints that parents were inadequately consulted. And I wonder this time uh, what changes you will put in place to ensure that more parents will be more adequately consulted so that you, you know, are immune to that uh, criticism mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. So... If I can go back again and comment on last time, because last time I would say that we probably consulted more with parents than would be the norm, because the curriculum development process for any subject does involve uh, a lot of consultation. It involves consultation with researchers, experts in the field, teachers, various stakeholder organizations, and parents and students. So that we did all of that, plus of course my Safe Schools Action Team, we actually did consultations all over the province. And I was trying to remember, I think maybe eight or ten different locations around Ontario. And those consultations involved parents, also involved police, 
sexual assault centers, women in crisis, various community groups, community groups that represented a variety of, of um, ethnic and religious viewpoints, actually. So we actually did quite an extensive consultation. What we're doing this time, though, I'm not really trying to skip out on your question here, <laughs> is that um, we, we've actually done a more formal survey this time, because one of the things that I said I want to be absolutely certain of this time is that we're getting responses from all four publicly funded systems. So that's English public, English Catholic, French public, French Catholic. And I want to make sure I'm getting uh, responses from all across Ontario. You? Yes. You are. Because the way we're doing that is we've written to each school, or at least to the director who wrote to the principals, and said, talk to your school council and ask a parent in each elementary school all across Ontario all four systems to respond to a survey. That way, we're sure that we're actually getting an accurate representation of all parents instead of those who feel particularly strongly about this topic. Gotcha. Here's some more feedback. This is from a group called the Institute of Marriage and Family Canada. It's from a report called Making Sex Education Work. Came out in November of 2014, and here's the quote. The Ontario Physical and Health Education Association commissioned a public health opinion poll. It found 87% of parents felt sexual health education in Ontario should be a component of the health curriculum. The AFIA poll also revealed that 96% of parents were comfortable with communicating to their own children about sex. Okay, to that end, I don't want to get too personal here, but you've got kids, right? I mean, they're adults now, but you've got kids. Did you feel comfortable at, let's say, grade three or at grade six, talking to them about some of the, you know, things that make a lot of parents uncomfortable discussing with their children, I mean, in your own personal situation? Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that I'm like most parents, is that there are some things that I felt perfectly comfortable talking about and other things that I didn't. And that's why education is so important is because we've got somebody who's a step removed from the emotion of the family able to provide information. So for example, one of the things that we know from public health data, and we want to make sure that we're looking at actual research data, one thing we know from public health data is that the rate of teen pregnancies has actually gone down since 2001. What we also know is that the rate of sexually transmitted infections in teenagers has gone up hmm. since 2001. So what does that tell you? Well, what that tells me is that the existing curriculum, which does talk about reproduction and contraception, that is doing a reasonably good job of making sure that kids understand reproduction and contraception, and the teen pregnancy rate is going down, and that's exactly what we want to happen. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in there, we're missing out on information about sexually transmitted infections and the ways in which sexually transmitted infections are transmitted. Mm -hmm. We need to fill in that blank for our kids because clearly if you've got teenage STI rates going up, we better do something about it because hmm. this is not good for the health and safety of our kids. Can you as the Minister of Education actually say to parents at the dawn of the 21st century, look, you've got to get over your own personal lack of comfort. The kids are learning all this stuff already in the schoolyard. And, and we just simply have to do this. Can you well, be that, that blunt about it? That goes back to what I was saying about internet and access to the internet. Mm -hmm. Because what's discussed at the family dinner table is not what's discussed in the playground. Now that, and you've got, even if your own kid doesn't have access to a personal device and doesn't have access to sites at the home computer that you've screened out, mm -hmm. there's at least one kid in the school who's got a device that's 
bringing stuff into the playground that has material that you and I and all the other parents would be absolutely horrified to look at. And that tends to be sometimes kids get into pornographic websites. Yeah. Sometimes they get into what I would call misogynist, but there's all kinds of sites out there that seem to be like rock videos, but they're really violent relationships that are being portrayed. And as, as parents, we can't ignore the fact that that's what happens in the real world to our children. We need to have conversations with our children that help our children understand what's normal good behavior and separate that from a lot of the trash that's out there. Sure, but uh, let me pick up on that trash because the proposals you're putting in place right now are, I mean, as you pointed out, they're based on a lot of what has come before. And some of that stuff, I mean, the, at the rate online is changing, um, you know, this stuff gets out of date pretty quickly. Are, are you concerned that the foundation upon which you're going to build this new curriculum is already out of date. And by the time this becomes law, who knows, it might be four, five, six years old at that point. Well, I think what we can do is if we've got the proper hooks in the curriculum, so we're talking about, for example, internet safety, mm -hmm. so that you have to work with the kids on internet safety and understanding that when you post stuff, it's going to stay there forever. That principle isn't going to change. The technology hook may change. Um, whatever is the flavor of the month in terms of what's on the internet that you don't want your kids to see, the details are going to change. But talking to children about what is a healthy, respectful relationship, talking to kids about the fact that abstinence is actually a really good choice. Ironically, uh, the proposed curriculum has in it more information about healthy relationships and abstinence than the old curriculum, and that's sort of being Minister, you're what's sounding blocked. like a conservative Republican now. <laughs> no, I'm not being. But there. but but for our, for kids who get a steady diet, normalizing violent relationships and sexualized relationships. Yeah. We actually need to talk to them about, you know what, if you're 12, abstinence is the best bet. <laughs> right. And we need to do that better than we're doing it right now. Is there, though, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people get very exercised every time the curriculum, uh, th there's an attempt to update the curriculum because they think this may be the one way in which students learn about all of this. But we know that's not the case for sex ed. We well, know that there's lots of other places yeah, where they learn yeah. about this. So uh, I guess the question is, is a lot of this spinning wheels? Because at the end of the day, these kids are going to learn about a lot of this stuff somewhere else, and it's not going to be in class. They're going to get a lot of information that isn't good information, uh, yeah, information outside right. class, regardless of what we do. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility as adults is to make sure that they get good, accurate information and that they get good guidance as to what, in terms of what are appropriate decisions. The World Health Organization has actually done a lot of inf uh, work on this, and their data shows that children who get good, accurate sexual health information before they need it that is, before their bodies have totally sexually matured, are actually less likely to have risky behaviors. So when the World Health Organization looks at curriculum around the world and says, you know, good information early, not so good information late, the kids who are actually least likely to have inappropriate, risky sexual behavior are the ones that got the good information early. Okay. Uh, the notion of, again, 10 years ago this wouldn't have been an issue, but it is now. Sexting pornography. Will this updated curriculum directly address that? I certainly hope so. We've got people looking right now at where we need to updates from the earlier proposal. 
and uh, certainly something I've had them said I'd like them to have a look at is the whole area of internet safety, but sexting in particular. The Premier has specifically asked that we look at the whole area of informed consent. Obviously, the discussions that we've been having in the media lately, um, we realize that we don't need to just talk about healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. We need to make it crystal clear and explicit that informed consent is required, and we need both the boys and the girls to get the same information. Right. Uh, a question about, you mentioned the four school systems earlier. Mm -hmm. We have French, English, Catholic, public. Um, there have been times in the life of this government where the separate school system, and, let me rephrase, where the publicly funded Catholic school system and the publicly funded secular school system have not been on the same page on some big issues, gay-straight alliances, for example, in the schools. And I wonder whether the updated sex ed curriculum will be the same in the publicly funded Catholic system and the publicly funded secular system. There is one curriculum document, and it's our expectation that all four systems will be using the same curriculum document. What does happen is that um, the Catholic uh, system does do some fine-tuning for their kids, but it isn't changing the curriculum. It's more likely to be that here's what we teach in health, and then their family life program would say, and here's the Catholic take on it. So it isn't that the curriculum isn't delivered, it's that fam the family life curriculum would have some Catholic commentary on the curriculum. But we've actually been working all along with, as we would with any subject area, with, uh, with the, our Catholic education partners. So in fact, the Catholic education stakeholders have been involved in the development of the curriculum. Do you just finally have any information which would lead one to believe that it's a good idea to separate boys and girls into separate classes for this part of the curriculum? I think what will happen is at different grades and even conceivably with different topics that teachers will figure it out for themselves. We don't give that direction. Uh, in fact, all curriculum is this is what you need to teach, and then the teacher figures out the how-to. So definitely within the range of how-to is what, if any, topics at what grade level do you want to keep the boys and girls separate. So that's an option teachers that's can do. That's an option that teachers and schools can have a look at on their own. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for coming into TVO and You're helping us out with this tonight. Liz Sandals, Minister of Education for the Province of Ontario. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.